Next on Time Space Visualizer, we continue with the second part of our interview with Phil Collinson, who was one of the key architects of the return of Doctor Who to our screens back in 2005. In this part, we'll discuss the series further, including the casting of David Tennant into the lead role. So we've got the series ready for, for air, and it launches with a massive spectacular. What sort of a reaction were you expecting for the show? Well, a few weeks before the show premiered on Easter Saturday, we had had a big um, press launch in Cardiff. And usually these press launches happen in London and, you know, we all have to get on the train and go down there. And um, um, we, we didn't do it like that. Um, you know, obviously, um, a big part of the show's identity was Wales. It, BBC Wales was really important to the show. And, and, I, and as, as the producer of the show, took that role very seriously and they were very excited about it. So we brought everybody to Cardiff and we took over a hotel and, um, for the night. And um, it was phenomenal. It was just phenomenal. It was, it was the biggest press launch I'd ever been to or seen. Um, you know, they, they, the, the title sequence was projected on the side of the hotel. There was a red carpet. There was people in costume and, you know, there were Slitheen and, and Daleks and, and, and various different monsters sort of lurking about, lots of local press and, and national news came. Um, and we showed the first episode and then we showed a, a clip reel of 10 minutes. And, um, uh, the 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 first episode uh, we showed and we had people laughed in all the right places and and then we started showing the clip reel and at the end of the last reel on the clip reel um, um, was the Dalek uh, saying elevate and he starts to rise up and the whole room went mad and everybody stood up and cheered and this is diehard journalists. You know, this is not just, you know, this is not, not, not fans, but this is diehard journeys. And the best part about it was that sitting in front of me was Terence Dix and Barry Letts. And uh, uh, before we'd sat down, I went across and I introduced myself to Barry and told him what, how I made it wonderful I thought the show had been under his tenure and, and how thrilled I was to meet him, etc. And he said, well... You know, I have to tell you that, um, you know, uh, Terence and I, um, um, are, are, you know, we're watching you now. We want this to be good. It better had to be good because we, you know, the last time they tried to resurrect this show, we were less than pleased. And we let them know that that, that was the case. So I was quaking in my boots, really. Anyway, as, the, as, 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 as everybody was cheering, um, 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 Barry turned around to me and gave me a thumbs up. And he just, and he said that afterwards, he said, I think it's brilliant. I mean, um, you know, obviously we'd used, it, it felt very much like his era of the show because it was modern day contemporary London with autons bursting out of windows and all of that. So they were chuffed to bits. So, so I sort of, in, in my head, I knew that we sort of had the, it was like having a, you know, having their stamp of approval really mattered to me because their reaction felt like, the fans' reaction as well to me, because they were, you know, the godfathers of Doctor Who, really, weren't they? Let's be honest. Um, um, and so I love that. But then also knowing, seeing that reaction from the journalists, and I sort of felt, and, and also was my instinct as a fan myself, I loved what we'd done with it. I was thrilled to bits. Uh, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, having said that, you never know. We were taking on Ant and Deck, who were un beatable at the time you know you can't ever forget how popular that show of theirs was um back then um you know and and it went from being by a million miles the most watched show to to, to handing that mantle across to us because we overtook them very quickly um and kept those viewers so so i knew so i sort of without sounding arrogant i was confident that we had made the best fist of it that we possibly could that everything possible we had done um to to make this show as brilliant as it could be we we had done and you know and at the same time it was science fiction and it was you know it was bonkers some of it um um 
And so you never quite know how that, how's that going to land? Um, you know, I kind of thought we might get five or six million views and that would have been really respectable, but I wasn't really prepared for how big it would become um, as the weeks went on. And, you know, that first, even the, even the press for that first show was insane, you know. Um, you know, and then, and then we, be, you know, it, it, we became architects of our own, um, you know, problems at some point because the show then became a show that the tabloids were fascinated by and desperate to blow stories on. And, um, and, th- and so then a whole new thing came out for season two of, well, how do we keep our secrets? And how do we, you know, we knew, we knew that keeping the secrets of the show were as important as making it really. I mean, the, the, the press getting hold of the story quite so early on about Chris. Yes, that was a shame. Would have it's a shame, but again, I think, you know, in hindsight, it worked in our favour because, um, um, the, the, you know, just, it, it, the, you know, there is a saying that there's no such thing as bad publicity, which to some extent is true and to some extent is not. But certainly it meant that there was, you know, the first four or five weeks of the show's run was on the front pages almost every day for some reason or another. And that just helped this huge buzz that was going out, out about this show. And, and, and obviously it, it being matched by what people were then turning on and watching, you know, week one, they were in modern day London with dummies coming to life. Week two, they were on a space station in the far future with a trampoline with eyes. Episode three, you know, Dickens in London with Simon Callow as Dickens, you know, and four and five, Big Ben crashing, farting aliens in 10 Downing Street. This show never, you know, it, 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 it didn't let you stop and catch your breath deliberately um, in, those, in, those, in that first season. It was breakneck speed and, and it, was, it was, you know, brilliant and vivid, I think. Um, and that's what, you know, it, it didn't let you turn off, really. You had to keep coming back for more, really, because you saw that next week either you were getting a bit more of what you'd loved this week or you were somewhere completely different with these, with these characters that you were fascinated by. So, you know, um, he's a very clever man, Russell. And, and I think um, he was absolutely the best man to be masterminding this, the return of this show, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, I, I rewatched season one, um, beginning of the year. Good. And I was impressed because I reevaluated it. It had been a couple of years since I'd seen it. And I was just impressed. I was blown away because actually the ambition and the scale comes through really clearly. But the scripts, I mean, Dalek is just an amazing story. Yes, yes. Yes, yes it is. I mean, it's wonderful. And, and you know, um, um, the, 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 a big part of the success of the show was particularly episodes like Dalek, where you had a brand new audience, little young audience coming to the show and who genuinely didn't really know what a Dalek was. And they sat there with their dad who's saying, well, it comes from the dark planet Scarrow and there's a little man inside. And I lost count of the number of people who said to me, this show has been brilliant for bonding me with my kids again. And, and, and I think we sort of got a little bit out of the habit of watching telly with our children. Um, you know, I think, I think CBeebies is fantastic, and but I think it's a sort of you know show that a lot of parents will put their children in front of, and while they're doing something else, you know I think the idea of sitting down with your kid and watching something that you both get um, as much from, and that there are enough sort of gags and and and, and there's enough hooks and brilliant storytelling to keep you involved, but but enough vivid, brilliant, wonderful chases and farting aliens and pigs in spacesuits to keep a kid completely wide-eyed and entertained and thrilled um again that's russell's genius that's that is nobody i think writes that sort of show better than him um um you know i the, sarah jane adventures as well i mean was just brilliant and look how popular that show became with with children of of, of, a, of a certain age because it was you know it's all it's those same sort of that same ability of, 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 that Doctor Who always had, really, that it could appeal to 
the generations um, and would be that show that you could all get a little bit of something from. It became cool again to be a Doctor Who fan. Yeah, I know. Who knew, right? <laughs> when it wasn't cool when we were growing up, but it was cool to be a Doctor Who fan. In... Well, it was cool when I was growing up. It was cool, you know, when I was, when the BBC still loved it and it had a big enough budget and Tom was there. Tom was cool. Tom and Liz, um, uh, you know, Tom and Liz, Tom and Louise, Tom and Lala, they were cool. Oh. That, you know, I, I think, but it, it sort of became not cool as it as it struggled with its identity as as, as it sort of in those last few years really. But I think um, I think it, it 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 was a thrill anyway for me to be to be that fan um, making it and feeling that it was uh, you know it was as I think it was as good as I wanted it to be, yeah, and that mattered a lot to me. How did you approach recasting Chris then? How did you come about um, choosing David? Um, well, I, I didn't have very much to do with it, to be fair. Um, um, Julie and Russell were making um, Casanova for BBC One, um, working with David and watching rushes of David every day. I think they started making that pretty four or five episodes into Doctor Who's run. So it's pretty much, they were watching Doctor Who rushes and Casanova rushes one after the other. And I think it just was one of those moments where they both came in this one morning and said to each other, well, when we come to recast, he's going to be perfect, isn't he? And then obviously, you know, that happened a bit, a bit sooner than we would have anticipated, but but was nonetheless um, another piece of wonderful luck that we had um, really making that show that they would literally be watching two sets of rushes with two, with those two men in was was just a, a kind of thrill and, and allowed them to kind of go. And if you watch Casanova, actually, there's a lot of Doctor Who in Casanova. That 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 Casanova. There's a lot of there's a lot of cheek, um, you know, there's a lot of what David brought to the role in that, in that performance as well. Uh, I chatted recently to Louise Page um, for Time Space Visualizer yeah. and she um, shared the, the, the story behind how she came up eventually with the costume. Uh, it's such an interesting story, the way she, 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 she asked magic that out of where it came from. It was brilliant. Well, she turned up to, um, she came to, uh, 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 um, when Lucy, who designed um, Chris's costume and the whole first season, decided that she she was exhausted, God bless her, I think, and she she just couldn't come out. I met a lot of costume designers, and Louise came in with that costume design and uh, already, um, and, and I loved it, um, and Russell loved it. We all loved it, and that. And that's what she first did. What story did she tell? I, I didn't hear her tell this story. What did she oh, say? She, I mean, she literally, she told a very similar story where um, she came in and it was part of her portfolio almost. And um, they, I think you guys asked if you could take her away to have a consideration about Well, it. I said that. That's the costume, isn't it? And she was, well, yes, I guess so. Um, and I took the picture. I took it out. Well, I took the portfolio back with me and I said, look at this woman. Look what she's done. Look at this guy. And that was the costume we went with. And it was like, it was things like the length of it, the length of that coat. That's what set it apart. And the, and the, and the um, converse um, and the skinny, you know, what she, what she absolutely got was the kind of skinny waif David Tennant. Um, you know, and, and what do you do to that skinny waif, that really, to make him really fly? Um, yeah, she was, she was brilliant, really. it's brilliant. A very, very brilliant costume designer. And you think about how many costumes she had to do across one season. Lordy God, I'm mad. And, and changing, obviously, the lead actor after just one season. Um, obviously, you knew you had the right person. Um, yeah. We probably, as fans, knew you had the right person because we were aware of him. But it's a little bit like if you think about the Hartnell to Trout and regeneration, you're never quite sure how it's going to work. Yeah, well, I, and that's part of the success of the show, isn't it, really? That, again, as it turned out, we were, we, we were giving the big audience 
a, 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 another reason to tune, tune back in to season two because they were good because they the show was the show never settled into where you knew it would settle you, know, you think about what happened season three Billy was gone and there was a brand new companion coming in season four that companion had gone and there was another new companion so the dynamic changed all the time um and that's why the show has gone on for as long as it has, really, because it. I think. I think you, you never quite settle into knowing what it is, um, and what to expect from it. And that's that's, you know, that worked brilliantly for us. Um, so no, I don't think people did know what to expect. David certainly was not a well-known actor by any stretch at that point. Um, not the household name that he would go on to become as the Doctor. Um, you know, so in many ways, it's more like, for me, it's more like John Pertwee going into Tom Baker, really, because, you know, with Tom Baker, you had a, a brilliant, wonderful actor who we were sort of aware of, but, but suddenly an actor who blossomed in this part, who, who sort of the Doctor Who allowed him to become a superstar, really, at Tom and David, I think. Um, you know, an already fantastic actor then gets this role of a lifetime, I think, in many ways, and, and, and just grabs it with both hands. And, um, you know, and I think, you know, the, the brilliance of David is, you know, manyfold. He's a magnificent actor. Um, and, and, and that, you know, ability to be brilliant and funny and run around and, and have a fantastic time, but then to turn on a sixpence and be serious and then to turn on a sixpence and break your heart. All the things Tom had done, um, you know, all the things, lots of those actors who played Doctor Who did really, really well. Um, but I think David was magnificent um, as Doctor Who. You could see the shift change, actually. The, the, the show just kept going up through the gears, second season, third season. You were getting more confident in the production. Well, I suppose, like everything, you, get, you learn what you can do really well. Um, um, I, I, you know, I think Russell's scripts kept getting more and more ambitious, but, but we were glad of that as a production team. We were taking them and saying, yeah, give us more, give us more, give us more. We, you know, we were, we were loving it. And, I, and of course... You know, there was a confidence as we went into season two because we knew we had a hit show. We weren't trying to second guess what people liked and didn't like. We weren't trying to work out if the formula worked. We, we had a hit show and we loved it. It was brilliant. And a happy show behind the scenes at that stage as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we, we, we were learning on the job in season one. We kind of knew what we were doing from season two onwards, really. And so then, it be, so then it allowed you to put your effort in the right places and concentrate on making what, what you could do the best you could do, really. Um, and relaxing a bit. I think, you know, I certainly relaxed a lot more as we went along um, and started to enjoy it a lot more. Yeah. And that's going, to have been, that's going to have been probably the right thing for you because production is not the easiest of jobs, is it? <laughs> No, I mean, it's a big, um, it, you know, you're keeping a big machine going, um, you know, a big machine that's moving around on the back of a lorry all the time that's getting in and out of locations. You know, we weren't making Doctor Who like they made Doctor Who in the 60s, 70s and 80s, where, you know, most of the time they went to studio and built the sets or they would go to towards the end of the run they would go to one location wouldn't they and they'd sort so they'd go to Whitby and do a big load of filming for the Coast of Fenwick you know we were all over the place all the time moving in moving out so logistically it's a huge show um, it was enormously successful so there was a whole other layer of keeping it there in terms of press, feeding the press, but but starving the press at the same time, so that they were hungry for for stories and what you what you wanted, and and you know just the management of that, and still keeping it on budget. You know the thing about you know a day's filming on Doctor Who is is a lot more expensive than a day's filming on a lot of other shows because the cast's often big and guest and expensive and. You know, not only have you got some cast, but you've got five monsters played by five actors in suits. We've all got a technician with them, stunts, special effects. You know, all of these things are, are um, 
liable to run away with themselves financially if you're not careful. So it had to be managed financially really mm -hmm. carefully and practically really carefully. And then, you know, you've got to, there's a whole level of, I mean, it sounds boring, but just safety. So that when you're making a show that you, is relentlessly stunt heavy and special effect heavy, um, you make sure that you're doing that safely and you know, you're not going to injure anybody and, and it's all being the And all of that takes time and management. So I never worked harder before or since really. Do you have a favorite story out of the time that you were there? Um, I've quite a lot of, I, there are lots of them that I love. I mean, I, I love, um, I love Rose for lots of reasons. I watched that time and again. Um, um, I love the Unquiet Dead. Um, uh, I, I love, um, I love Midnight, I love Turn Left, uh, um, I love, um, Journey's End, I just love Journey's End, makes me cry, I love, I love Shakespeare Code, I love, there are lots of episodes that I'll watch again and again and again, um, Satan Pit, I've probably watched more than anything else, um, um, they were ju I just think that, that we were, at the top of our game when we made Satan Pit, actually. When I watch it now, it stands up now against anything that the show can deliver now. Um, anything, any other sort of, I remember watching that for the first time and just, I couldn't believe we'd made this in a little studio in Cardiff, in a, in a half empty, um, disused power station, you know, in Tredegar. Um, I, I think it looks a million dollars and, um, and, and something that I'm incredibly proud of. And, and you should be, because you're quite right. It's some of what you did, particularly in and around on some of the locations I know you use, because it's local to me, um, Cardiff, and it put Cardiff on the map to a degree for a lot of people. But um, I know what went on behind some of the scenes. So I was there on probably some of the filming sessions. The crowd. Yeah, and obviously, as, you went, as we, you know, again, I, I always... It's hard doing these things because there's a fine line between sort of blowing your own trumpet, which I which I'm not want to necessarily do, but but being proud of what you did and what you achieved is what is where I come from always, you know. And and at the same time, um, you know, Russell and Julie were also making Torchwood. You know, I was executing Sarah Jane Adventures as well, and we were so sort of, you know there was sort of you know, 40 odd episodes of sort of Doctor Who related stuff coming out of that, uh, our little team at the time. Um, I mean, if, incredible, really. I, I, I really now think we were mad and I don't know how we did it, but we did. Um, we were loved it. We were all, we were all completely devoted to the show and to our place in it and, and making it the best we could possibly make it. Yeah. And you showed no fear after you left Doctor Who either and moved, uh, uh, eventually arrived at, at, uh, in Weatherfield for Coronation Street. Um, yeah. it's, it's really unusual because I'm getting to talk about two of probably my most favourite programmes uh, that I've followed over the years. The 50th episode, The Tram Crash. Good grief, what were you thinking? <laughs> You know, it was a bit the same, really. I'd grown up watching Coronation Street and, you know, it was a big favourite of my parents and my grandparents and I'd sort of grown up loving it and being devoted to it. So it was a similar thing, really. I came to it expressly to, for the 50th anniversary. Um, I took over in the January of the 50th year. My stuff started going on, out on screen in July of the 50th year and then that six months of stuff all very deliberately led up to that one night. Um, and so, um, I, I mean, it was, again, I live and die. It was, it was among the best stuff I've ever done. I think it was my, um, you know, I, I live and die and I won't ever have the chance to do that. Because the thing with Coronation Street is you, what you transmit on Wednesday, the nation talks about on Thursday. You know, people are devoted to the show in enormous numbers still. Um, and um, I knew that I wanted to just do justice to this brilliant, wonderful icon. Um, and uh, I was a little bit worried because I, I knew that I'd, they, it needed to be a big disaster and that a part of it would be live 
Um, but it was about that, you know, and I think lots of things I'd learned on Doctor Who really about dealing with the press and, and how if you get them on board and get people, people's imagination fired up enough about what you're doing, they'll be, they'll be, they'll be dying for it. And, and I did a lot of that, engaged with the press a lot you know dribbled bits of stuff out so there was a real sense of anticipation of that week and then it just became it sort of you know people just got into it really and and, you know they arrived because they wanted because I you know I think what I did was I said this is going to be amazing you must watch it this is going to be amazing then I went home and kind of went oh god what if it's not what if it's not so then that pushed me on to kind of go, God, it's got to be amazing. It's got to be amazing. So I sort of was pushing everybody to their limits on that show. Um, I, of course, you know, brought in, you know, one of the best action directors, Graham Harper, came in to direct the first part of that, that the crash in the first episodes of that. Um, nobody else could have done that, I don't think. Um, Corey has a wonderful, brilliant bunch of, um, amazing, amazing directors, um, but but this these particular episodes needed someone who knew how to direct action, um, and because I knew that I wanted it to be as big as possible. And then the live was something I'd never done, and and it's when I started thinking about a live. EastEnders had done live. Corrie had done live. Corrie was doing live in 1960, for God's sake. Um, <laughs> Um, but, you know, then you kind of think, well, if I'm doing live, it has to be live like nobody else has ever seen before. Um, you know, and so then, then that grew and grew and that. So that became, well, because there was an option for us to make the first episode live, um, the, the episode that sort of leads you almost to the crash, um, that would have been easy because that's just Scar Nation Street. So then I was like, no, it needs to be right slap bang in the middle of the week when it's all going wrong and houses are collapsing and the fires are blazing and how do you do that as a live action um, which no one had ever done you know we did um the the show opened with a shot that was like a cgi comp that was happening live before you really and it was you know so there was a there was a huge ambition there and a thrill um um and, you know, a week that I'll never forget ever as long as I live. And then sort of to, to keep, I stayed um, possibly a bit longer than I planned to stay. Um, but it's a, it was, it's a lovely place to work. Um, and it's um, a really nice bunch of people. And as I say, you, you are speaking directly to the nation on that show. Um, in a way you never will, you know, I never will ever again. I never would want to actually, because it also brings with it a bit of, um, um, you know, press intrusion and and sort of people poke you in the supermarket and say, you know, you know, what what are you doing to Gail or Rita and don't do that and you know it's your fault that Audrey's got a transvestite boyfriend or whatever it is. Um, there's a bit of that that go, that goes along with that show. That's that's not that wasn't my favourite part of it, but I loved it. I had an amazing time there. Like, like Doctor Who, um, the Coronation Street of the modern world owes a lot to its roots and the whole genius of Tony Warren. Yeah, creating. Well, I was lucky enough to become friends with Tony, and Tony was still very much involved when I was producing the show and I would meet him every few weeks. We'd go out for lunch. We'd talk about what he'd watched. He'd tell me very candidly what he'd liked and didn't like. And, and, um, and so he was still really the godfather of the show and still really very involved. And, and um, so it was a pre- an absolute privilege to have him. Yeah. I could carry on for hours and hours and hours chatting about Coronation Street, Doctor Who and all sorts of things with you. But time's beaten us, I'm afraid. Phil, it's been a real pleasure to Thanks spend some time asking. with you, um, hear your thoughts behind Doctor Who and a little bit about Coronation Street. Appreciate you taking time out for us. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.